Today we are talking about the secret teachings of Mary Magdalene as we take a look at the banned gospel of Mary Magdalene. Now this is information that was banned by the church because in it Mary Magdalene is shown as the most important disciple and as we're going to see, the she was supposed to be the successor of Jesus Christ. She starts teaching the disciples. She starts revealing to them hidden secrets, revealing that reality isn't what it seems, that the material world is an illusion, that mind is the true nature of reality. And it's uh, very, very important. Um, you know, the church did not like these ideas at all. The church wants to control people. The church wants to have a patriarchal religion. And they did not like this idea of having a, a feminine figure be important in the role of a teacher because if you take a look at the new testament in the new testament it says that women aren't allowed to teach it says that women must be quiet and remain silent that they're lesser than men and they have to submit to their husbands and everything so having this idea of, of a woman being a teacher um especially the most important one was something that the church did you know did not like and um for a number of reasons uh this gospel was banned along with a lot of different Gnostic Gospels. So this, uh, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene is known as a Gnostic Gospel. There's a lot of different Gnostic Gospels. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Philip, the Secret Book of John, uh, the Hypothesis of the Archons, the um, Apocalypse of Adam. And I've done live streams about almost all of these that I've mentioned, except for the Gospel of Philip, but I'm sure we'll do that. We'll talk about that later. So there are playlists if you want to check those out on my channel. Check them out. I've talked about all of them. But anyway, um, these 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 Gospels and secret books, etc., were all banned by the church. They didn't comport with the church's teachings. And we're going to be taking a look at the Gospel of Mary Magdalene today. And like I said, this is a really important one. Really, really interesting one, and I like it a lot. Now, unfortunately, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene um, was was discovered in the in 1945 near the tombs of ancient Egypt, buried buried near the tombs of ancient Egypt. Probably someone risked their lives because if you were caught with these books, you could be put to death. So someone risked their lives to try and save these, buried them in the in the tombs of ancient Egypt near the near the tombs of ancient Egypt. Unfortunately, they have sustained a lot of damage. So we don't have very much of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, but we have some pages. We have a few pages. We have a few chapters. That's what we're going to look at today. Um, there's not much of it left though, but we're going to be taking a look at the parts that we do have, and we'll see. We'll see. Um, how we go here. So let's just start right away. And this is the gospel according to Mary Magdalene. And um, oh, I also want to mention that that you you can read these online. Um, if you just people are always like, oh, where, where do you get these? Just Google it and, and you can read it for yourself. So uh, let me bring this up here. So we actually start on chapter four, the gospel according to Mary Magdalene, the gospel of Mary, we actually start in chapter four. And it's uh, really interesting that we start off right away with the disciples asking Jesus about the true nature of matter. Like they're asking about what essentially we're going to see what matter is. And this is really important because we're going to see that the revelation is that matter is not, uh, matter is ultimately an illusion. But one thing that I want to point out too about Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene is mentioned in the Bible, but not but she's not given the importance of being a disciple, let alone the most important disciple. And that's unfortunate because even in the Bible, she has an important position as being one of the first people to see Jesus. And so metaphorically speaking, that's really important. We have to remember all these stories are metaphors. So Mary Magdalene being one of the first people to see Jesus is extremely important and should have given her a position of priority and prominence, even in even in Christian orthodoxy, because Mary Magdalene is in the Bible, but not very much, but but a bit. She was the first one of the first people to see Jesus rise from the dead. So again, these stories are metaphors. Jesus didn't actually rise from the dead and all that, but that's signifying that Mary should have a very important position. Um, and she is not recognized as a disciple, let alone the most important disciple. And it's really interesting, later on, the church actually, there, there is another character in the Bible story, in the New Testament, about a prostitute. And the church ends up saying that that's Mary Magdalene. So 
to make a long story short, because I want to get to this, I want to read the actual gospel, but it's important to understand like the, the church's um, perspective on this. Not only did the church not give her an important role, they made her into a prostitute. Now, that's not to say there's anything wrong with prostitution. I am a huge supporter of sex workers' rights. We, um, you know, had a had a, a charity event for sex workers' rights, and, and that's very, very important to me and to what we promote. But you can understand that, especially in the time of when 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 that happened, uh, that was looked at very, very negatively. So to make the association of Mary Magdalene with a prostitute was was you know a negative association. Now again, I want to make it clear, I don't believe that's a negative association at all. I'm a very supportive of sex workers' rights. Um, but you can understand how back then it would it was something that that was sinful. So I want to make that clear. Now to to be fair, it said that they didn't do that to try and smear Mary Magdalene, but to show that anyone can be saved. Because basically, Mary Magdalene, uh, they made they made Mary Magdalene into this prostitute character, and then said, well, that Jesus forgave her of her sins, and then she was purified. So they try to say that, oh, well, they were really giving her a, a good position by doing this. But it seems very, very suspect to me that, um, you know, you have this uh, person who's supposed to be an extremely important person, but they start, they, they don't give her an important role, and then they start making these other connotations that in that time would have been looked at as very sinful and very negative. So the church just hasn't been super great with regard to what they have done. Um, now, and, and again, I just want to be really, really clear, 100% um, supportive of uh, sex workers' rights and all that. It's very important, very important. Um, but to continue, Let's just actually start this and see what this is all about, because Mary Magdalene is a very, very important figure in Gnosticism. So it starts off by saying, and these are the disciples talking to Jesus, will matter then be destroyed or not? And Jesus says, the Savior said, all nature, all formations, all creatures exist in and with one another, and they will be resolved again into their own roots. And this in itself is really, really fascinating because what you're seeing here is that Christ is talking about all things being connected. All nature, all formations, all creatures exist in and with one another, and they will be resolved again into their own roots. So it's kind of like saying that these creatures, all nature, all formations, all creatures, they came from the same root and they will be resolved again into the same root where it says for the nature of matter is resolved into the roots of its own nature alone and this is important to understand because for gnostics and the gospel of mary magdalene is a gnostic gospel for gnostics the material world is an illusion that's ultimately a product of mind like the ultimate reality is mind and from mind comes the illusion of matter so ultimately, everything is rooted in mind. And I think that, it, that it's really interesting as well that you can almost kind of see this as uh, almost being a bit of a description of the Big Bang as well, where it says all nature, all formations, all creatures exist in and with one another, and they'll be resolved again into their own roots for the nature of matter resolved into the roots of its own nature. So it's kind of, you can kind of see that it's, it has some sort of similarity to the Big Bang if you think about everything coming from one root and then being resolved again into the root of its own nature. It's like matter coming forth and then, you know, coming forth from a singularity and then returning to a singularity. So... Christ says, he who has hear, ears to hear, let him hear. Now, this is really important, too, to understand that, remember, all these stories are metaphors, all these stories are symbols, and all these books are codes. And these word, the wording of it is very important. So this, So one has to really look into these things. When it says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Christ says this often. So what does this mean? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
Well, that's saying, if you have the capacity to understand what I'm saying, listen. It's like saying those with the level of consciousness needed to understand this sort of thing, listen. It's, it's, it's like the saying with those who, like those who have the eyes to see. It's a level of consciousness. So those who have the ears to hear, let him hear. Those who, who, who can grasp this information, this is important. This is important information. And, and, and listen. So it's a really emphasis on the importance of what's being said. And so Peter said to him, since you have explained everything in, to us, tell us this also. What is the sin of the world? Now, Mary Magdalene is going to come in pretty soon, by the way. But we have to have this sort of uh, prologue is, is, is important. It's not literally a prologue. But this is important to kind of set up what's going on with, with Mary. So, Peter said to him, since you have explained everything to us, tell this uh, us also, what is the sin of the world? The Savior said, there is no sin. But it is you who make sin when you do things that are like the nature of adultery, which is called sin. And you can imagine that, that this line here is probably something else that the church probably was not too fond of. The Savior said, there is no sin. You know, the, the, the church is going to want to emphasize sin because sin is what keeps people bound to the law. Because if you, you have to repent for your sins. You have to live a life... Uh, according to righteousness, because you don't want to be sinful. So um, this line was also probably something that was thought to be a heresy. So that is why the good came into your midst to the essence of every nature in order to restore it to its root. So again, they're talking about um, why the good came into your midst to the essence of every nature in order to restore it to its root. And um, it's interesting that he uses the word good here because this is uh, very common in Platonism as the highest principle of mind, the good. And so it's an interesting way of, of most likely talking about the good came into your midst to the essence of every nature in order to restore it to its root. It's like mind, mind, consciousness coming into the essence of nature to restore everything to mind once again. So the ability of mind to self-reflect, self-consciousness is coming into your midst so that through knowledge and understanding, everything will be returned to its root, meaning that the material illusion of reality will be stripped away and everything will be returned to perfect mind. Then he continued and said, that is why you became sick and die, for you are deprived of the one who can heal you. And wh why does one become sick and die? Well, ultimately, becoming sick and dying is an illusion of matter. Our avatars are what becomes sick and dies. We as eternal minds, we don't become sick and die. We are eternal. Our bodies are uh, ephemeral. And our bodies will get sick and die. And it's important to... Even though we are eternal, you need to take care of yourself. You need to take care of your body. You need to be healthy. That's very important. We're here to learn, grow, and understand. So you want to make sure that your avatar is healthy and in good condition. But ultimately, um, th that's the idea. And I just want to, it says, uh, and, and so then he continued, that is why you became sick and die, for you are deprived of the one who can heal you. Well, who is the one that can heal you? The only one that you can heal you is yourself in your own self-reflection and understanding your, your divinity. And you won't become sick and die when you understand what you are, meaning you'll realize that you are eternal and that becoming sick and dying is, is ultimately, ultimately just what happens in the material realm. Now, the Gnostics didn't like matter. The whole idea of Gnosticism was to escape, to escape, to escape, to escape, to escape. Like that's the material world is evil. The material world is a prison. We have to escape. We have to get out of here. That was the whole sort of idea of Gnosticism. Now, I want to make it clear that um, what I promote in our system that we talk about here, matter isn't intrinsically evil. There is a domain of mind and a domain of matter, and matter is an expression of mind. We call this domain of mind the holos. Now, the holos isn't something that's necessarily evil or that we're trying to escape from. The domain of matter is just like a canvas for us to create. We can create whatever we want. And it actually can be something wonderful and great when we can create something beautiful. And, um, you know, to be fair, 
the Gospel of Thomas is a is a is another Gnostic gospel, but they have a different. There are different versions of Gnosticism, and in the Gospel of Thomas, you should check that out on my channel. By the way, I have a whole all videos on the Gospel of Thomas. It's a really good one. I highly recommend it. It's it's a very very good Gnostic gospel, but it talks about how the kingdom of heaven is all around you. You just need to be able to see it. Meaning, this is our world and this is our domain. We just need to realize that and take control of it, and that is our position, not the position of we need to escape. We need to, we, this place is hell. This place is awful. That This is our place. This is our world and we can transform it. And that it's really shitty and awful right now, but it doesn't have to be. It's like a painting. The painting can be, if you're painting with shit, it's going to be a shitty painting. Well, that's why this world is in a shitty place because you have people who are only interested in their own self and they're not enlightened. They don't understand what reality is. They don't understand what they are, where they are, why they're here. And so it's a mess. But we know that we can transform this world, and that's ultimately what it means to be gods. We are gods, and, and gods don't escape, they don't run away. Gods transform. Gods create. We want to transform the world. We want to create a new world. We don't want to escape and run away, because the whole point of life is to create and transform, grow and learn, and we can make this reality into our masterpiece. So I think that's something, there's a lot of great things about Gnosticism, a lot of things I like about Gnosticism. And there's different versions. It was specifically Sethian Gnosticism that did not like the material world uh, and thought it was hell. But the, the um, type of Gnosticism associated with the Gospel of Thomas had a different a different view. So uh, let's see. So Christ continues, he who has a mind to understand let him understand. You see, it's even more clear here. First, he says, those who have ears to hear, let him hear. Now, he who has a mind to understand, let him understand. And this is, again, talking about how this is important information with regard to consciousness. Those who have the capacity, like, listen up, this is important. Matter gave birth to a passion that has no equal, which proceeded from something contrary to nature. Then there arises a disturbance in the whole body. That is why I said to you, be of good courage. And if you are discouraged, be encouraged in the presence of the different forms of nature. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When the Blessed One had said this, he and I, and I just, I love that he keeps saying this over and over because this is what the Gnostics were doing. The Gnostics were intentionally writing in code and metaphor. And that's what a lot of people don't understand about the stories in the Bible and Gnosticism, that these are not literal events that occurred. Now, it's probably some of them, some of the stories in the Bible, I'm sure, I know, are based on actual events, but they've been, a whole story and narrative has been wrapped around it. Kind of like if you buy a, a book, a fiction book, let's say it's a murder mystery novel, and it takes place in New York, and there's real characters who live in New York and real cities and everything. Well, yeah, it uses people, locations, and whatnot that actually existed, but the story is going to be a fictional story around it. Well, same ideas with the stories in the Bible and the Gnostic stories, some of the events and places and people, but there's a whole uh, a fictional narrative around it that's meant to be understood in a uh, symbolic and metaphorical way. Now, of course, that's not how the church interpreted it, and look at the mess we, we, we have gotten into because of that. So what's important to understand about that is that the Gnostics knew that very, very well, and they were writing their books specifically in a way to get people to understand this information. So when people criticize the Gnostic books and they say things like, oh, well, they're not consistent or they were written later. So, so it probably wasn't an accurate retelling of events or whatever. People are, they're totally missing the point. It doesn't matter. The Gnostics didn't care. They weren't trying to be consistent. They didn't care about what time a certain thing was written. It was about the hidden message behind it, not the story. If you're just if you're just looking at the story at face value, you're miss you're you're only getting the exoteric version. You're not understanding the esoteric version. And I love how he's constantly he who has ears, let him hear. He who has a mind to understand, let him understand. They're trying to emphasize, hey, listen, see what we're trying to get across here. See what we're trying to convey here. And a really good example of this, I think, is you know, a lot of people talk about, well, was Mary Magdalene really the wife of Jesus, etc. And ultimately, that that doesn't matter. That that whole story, 
it it doesn't really matter because all these events are highly narratorized around a fiction anyway. What what really matters is because, for example, in the Gospel of Philip, it says that Jesus kissed Mary often on the mouth. Now, to be fair, it actually says Jesus kissed Mary often on the, and then very dramatically that that piece is missing, very very dramatic. Um, but it's most likely the mouth. Uh, Jesus kissed Mary often on the mouth. In the in the in another Gnostic gospel, another banned gospel, the Gospel of Philip said this. Now. And people are like, oh, well, maybe Jesus and Mary were married. And here's the thing. Th these books are, are metaphors and code. So saying that Jesus kissed Mary on the mouth is a code and metaphor for conveying the importance and the equality of the divine feminine. And a kiss, kissing on the mouth is showing an intimate understanding of, because, you know, Christ represents, like, conveying the true knowledge of reality. And so... Kissing Christ on the mouth and being the most important of the disciples is showing the, the, the there's an equality there. There's an, the kissing on the mouth is an equality. So a good example is in the Gospel of Thomas. In the Gospel of Thomas, check out my videos on that. It's, it's a really good one. You should check it out. It's important. In the Gospel of Thomas, it talks about those who drink from Christ's mouth. That people that certain people drink from Christ's mouth. Now, of course, that's not literally literally true. There's not there weren't people walking around with a with a Jesus fetish drinking from his mouth. What that what that represents, drinking from Christ's mouth, means understanding what Christ is saying and integrating it into you. Truly drinking from his mouth, truly be understanding it, integrating it, being nourished by it. So obviously that's not literally true that people were drinking from his mouth. It's a metaphor for that. Same thing with Christ kissing Mary on the mouth. It's even more so this intimate uh, showing an intimate understanding of knowledge and there being that equality there. And that's so much more important and so much more interesting than just kind of like silly gossip. Like, oh, well, were Jesus and Mary married? Like, well, maybe they were married. Like, I mean, that can be fun to think about. But do you see how much more interesting and fascinating and important the true message is about the 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 empowerment of the divine feminine and the importance of it and um, the true understanding? You, you see what I'm saying? People always miss the message for the story. And this is why we get into a lot of, you know, terrible situations in the world, because people take the stories as literal. And then you have everyone killing each other because, oh, well, it's Jehovah versus Jesus versus Allah. And now you have them all fighting with each other because they're all uh, say, well, it's my God that's the right God. And you don't, it's like, no, 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 no. There's just one underlying principle. And people have understood this underlying principle through different symbols and metaphors. Um, Anyway, I digress. I just want to really emphasize that importance there because people, I get so many people that say, well, the Gnostic Gospels aren't credible because they were written at a different time or they're not consistent. It doesn't matter. Gnostics didn't care. And the Bible stories were narratorized around a fiction anyway. And the, the whole idea was to um, put this out there in a way where they're, they, that information was being passed to people who had the eyes to see, the ears to hear, and the mind to understand. And that's the whole idea. You can take a, check out my videos on Freemasonry as, as well. It talks about this in Freemasonry where you write these, these coded stories where people who aren't very conscious will just read it like it's a story. Like, oh, well, that was interesting. Uh, but those who, with the eyes to hear, the mind to understand, will see the hidden message behind it and realize that it's all a symbol and a metaphor and a code. So, um, and there's a lot more to this as well. But let's let's continue. He has ears to let him hear. So when the Blessed One had said this, when, God, when, when Jesus said this, he greeted them all saying, peace be with you, receive my peace unto yourselves. Beware that no one lead you astray, saying, Lo here or lo there, for the Son of Man is within you. Follow after him. Those who seek him will find. Go then and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Do not lay down any rules beyond what I appointed you, and do not give a law like the lawgiver, lest you be constrained by it. When he said this, he departed. This is so important. Look at what's being said here, okay? Okay. Because what we're going to find out is that the Gospel of Mary is a criticism of what would become Christian orthodoxy. You have these, the Gnostic, so Gnosticism, 
was before before Christian orthodoxy was established, the the Christianity was divided on what Christianity actually was. It was trying to people were trying to figure out, you know, did Jesus actually exist or or not, or was he was he a man, or um. I'm, I'm sorry, that was the debate. The, was was Jesus a spirit or was he a man or was he a creation of God or is he God? All these kinds of debates. There was even a debate, especially if the God of the Bible, Jehovah, was evil or a good God. And a lot of the Gnostics said that he was actually an evil God. Now, um, so so what what's going on here is that this is a criticism of the type of Christianity that would become Christian orthodoxy. So what's Christ saying? Beware that no one lead you astray, lo here or lo there, for the Son of Man is within you. So don't be led astray by saying that Christ is here or Christ is there. Christ is in you. And what this means, Christ is in you, means that you can become, you are Christ. That's what that means. People, that that's, when it says Christ is within you, that means that you are Christ. And being Christ means understanding that you're divine. Understanding your divine nature. That's what becoming Christ is. And that idea, like in Freemasonry, is called the perfect master. And uh, we talk about it as hyper awareness. It's a new, it's a new form of consciousness. You hear people talk about Christ consciousness. That's, that's that as well. In the, there's differences between all these different things, but to generalize because of time constraints, that's what this is about. So to say that Christ, the Son of Man was in you is mean Christ is within you. You can become Christ when you realize what you are. So don't let anyone lead you astray saying that Christ is somewhere else. So follow after him. Those who seek him will find him. Go then and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Do not lay down any rules beyond what I appointed you, and do not give a law like the lawgiver, lest you be constrained by it. When he said this, then he departed. All right, what did the Orthodox Christian Church do? Made a shit ton of rules and constrained people by it. That was a very core part of the patriarchal religion of control that was established and backed by the Roman Empire. It was, it was uh, totally a system of laws and control. So this is a, a criticism here. Now, here we get to, very important because Mary's going to come on the scene. So when he said this, he departed. But they were grieved. They wept greatly, saying, How shall we go to the Gentiles and preach the gospel of the kingdom of the Son of Man? If they did not spare him, how will they spare us? Then Mary stood up, greeted them all, and said to her brethren, Do not weep, and do not grieve, nor be irresolute, for his grace will be entirely with you and will protect excuse me, protect you. But rather let us praise his greatness, for he has prepared us and made us into men. Now, a couple things I want to say here. The first thing that uh, really important to um, understand is that Mary standing up and greeting them all and, and telling them not to weep. She's taking a leadership position. Christ left, he's gone. The leader is gone and everyone else is crying. They're grieving. They don't know what to do. They're scared. Mary stands up, takes that position and says, hey, don't worry, everything's gonna be fine. We got this. So this is now Mary taking a leadership position. And like I've said in my, my other video on the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, I believe that this book is a criticism of Christian orthodoxy, and it, it, it again, this is something that got the, the Gnostics did all the time, so I believe that Mary represents Gnosticism, while the other disciples represent what would become orthodoxy, and so it's really saying that Gnosticism, this acknowledgement of the importance of the divine feminine, is what should be leading the way that should be the successor of Jesus because Mary is being becoming the successor of Jesus here. Jesus left, everyone's panicking, crying, and weeping. Mary steps up and takes his place. Mary is now becoming the successor of Jesus and this should mean that the feminine inclusive Gnosticism should be the true interpretation of Christianity because everyone else is 
trying and freaking out. They don't know what to do. So Mary steps up. Mary takes the leadership position, becomes the successor of Jesus. Now, there is a line here I want to point out because it says Mary stood up, greeted them all, and said to her brethren, do not weep and do not grieve nor be irresolute for his grace will be entirely with you and he will protect you. But rather, let us praise his greatness for he has prepared us and made us into men. Now that line, for he has prepared us and made us into men. So what does that mean? Now you'll notice that men is with a capital M here. Now there, there's debate on what, what this stuff kind of means. Um, uh, I've heard some Gnostic scholars say how in Gnosticism, uh, they they used maleness as a metaphor for um, the higher self. So it wasn't actually a referral to because in, in Gnosticism, there the 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 importance of, of, of feminine, the feminine power is like all over the place. It's emphasized often more than, uh, you know, almost always the heroes are, are females. You have Sophia, Norea, Eve. Um, Mary. So it's very, very uh, feminine inclusive. Even Jesus is, is portrayed as an avatar of Sophia. Now, um, so some, some Gnostic scholars think that prepared us and made us into men is talking about unlocking one's higher self, that, that, that uh, maleness was a Gnostic way of talking about the higher, that it actually didn't refer to maleness, but that was because, you know, they talk in code and metaphor, that was their way of doing so. Now, is that true? I don't know. So what I do want to say, though, is that um, I like Gnosticism. I think it's great. I, uh, for the most part, um, there's a lot of stuff that I don't, dis uh, that I disagree with it. Uh, I think some of it is, is negative. And it is way more uh, enlightened and forward thinking than what was Christian orthodoxy and much more inclusive of the feminine by a long shot than, than orthodoxy. But lines like this, is that good? No, like I think that's shitty. I don't think that you should, regardless of what it actually means. Um, you know, I, I don't think one should use maleness as, as, uh, you know, even as a code or a metaphor or whatever for, for that. So these things aren't perfect. They're not perfect. They were written a long time ago uh, in a different world, in a different time. They're not perfect. There's there's going to be some stuff that uh, aren't good. You're going to probably find sexist stuff in, in Gnostic work uh, as well. But very, 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 very minimally compared to what you would find in orthodoxy. But I just want to point that out. Gnosticism is not perfect. They have ideas that aren't great. And they use certain wordings sometimes that are unfortunate. And, you know, I would say that something like this uh, should have been worded in a, in a different way, but there you go. You know, it was, that's, that's, that's my thought on this, but to not distract from the fact that you have this very powerful feminine figure taking the success, uh, being the successor of Jesus. So you can see that there's still like a very, very cool, powerful feminine um, empowerment going on here, despite a poorly chosen word for um, a metaphor. Uh, but I just want to, you know, be clear about that and point that out. So you have the disciples crying. They don't know what to do. Jesus left. And now Mary steps up as Christ's successor. So when Mary said this, she turned their hearts to the good and they began to discuss the words of the Savior. So he turned their hearts to the good. They start using their minds. They start talking about things that Jesus taught them. And Peter said to Mary, sister, we know that the Savior, Savior loved you more than the rest of women. Tell us the words of the Savior, which you remember, which you know, but we do not nor have we heard them. So Peter is saying, hey, we know that Christ loved you more than all the other women and that he told you secrets of existence that we don't know. Will you tell us? And, it, and Mary answered and said, what is hidden from you, I will proclaim to you. So you can see, not only is Mary taking the role of leader, Mary is taking the role of teacher. What did, what did Christ always do? Te he taught the disciples. So... Jesus left, Mary stood up as leader, and now they're coming, they're like, okay, hey, Mary, can you, can you teach us? Mary is now leader and teacher, succeeding Jesus. And um, so Mary answered and said, what is hidden from you, I will proclaim to you. And she began to speak these words. I, she said, I saw the Lord in the vision, and I said to him, Lord, I saw you today in the vision. He answered and said to me, 
Blessed are you that did not waver at the sight of me. For where the mind is, there is the treasure. And I, I really love this because it's, it's just, it's such, it's always such a jab at orthodoxy because in Christian orthodoxy, it's, it's for, um, uh, what is it? It's like where, where the heart is there, your treasure will be also. And then for Gnostics it's for where the mind is, there is the treasure. And there's nothing wrong with the heart or emotions. That's, that's fine. But you can see where, you know, orthodoxy is all about faith and belief and, uh, you know, feeling you're saved because you feel Jesus or, or the, you feel the Holy Spirit. Whereas Gnosticism is all about the mind, looking within, understanding your own divinity, reflecting on the nature of reality, understanding yourself. And so I just, I really love this line, you know, for where the mind is, there is the treasure. So that the mind, where the mind is, that is what is important. That is where value is, where the mind is, there is value. There is where the true value is. So I said to him, Lord, how does he who see, sees the vision see it through the soul or through the spirit? So she's basically wanting to know, you know, I'm having this vision. How am I seeing this vision? Is it through the soul or is it through the spirit? The Savior answered and said, he does not see through the soul nor through the spirit, but the mind that is between the two that is what sees the vision. And again, this super, just so cool how, because again, in, in orthodoxy, it's all about faith and 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 the soul and, and whatnot. And here, this because Mary's even asking, is it the spirit or the soul? And, and, and Christ is going, it's not the spirit, it's not the soul. It's the mind that sees the vision. It's the mind that understands, when by seeing the vision, the mind is what understands the higher levels of reality the levels of reality beyond matter. It's the, it's the mind. You can access it through the mind. Now, this was, ch we started on chapter four. This was chapter five. We lost a bunch of chapters and we go to chapter eight because guess what? Church <laughs> burned these documents. And uh, so we don't have we only have the copies that we have that were buried in the tombs of Egypt and these chapters are missing. So we have to go to, to chapter eight, which starts with it. <laughs> it. We did, we had, we saved it. Uh, so, but, but this is what we can, we can piece together what's happening because we know what the Gnostics believed through other Gnostic gospels. So Mary is having this vision through the mind. And it starts by saying, and I'll give you some context. Let me see how long this is. Okay, so we don't have, I think we'll be able to get through this in one video. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and so let's let's talk about how, I really could stop here and we could do, do a two-parter because it's already been, what, 30 minutes? Let's just do the whole thing, I guess. Let's do the whole thing. Because, this, so so Mary is, is talking to Jesus. And, uh, uh, seeing, seeing, I'm sorry, Mary is having this vision and through the mind. And what's happening really here is that Mary is seeing different levels of reality, mental reality beyond the physical. Because remember, the material world is the illusion. And she's talking to different, one could say, evil entities. But we're going to understand what this means. So let's just start and I'll explain it. And desire said... I did not see you descending, but now I see you ascending. Why do you lie since you belong to me? The soul answered and said, I saw you. You did not see me nor recognize me. I served you as a garment and you did not know me. So what's basically happening here, you you have uh, these these evil beings in the form of different powers. And that's the cool thing about Gnosticism. Check out my book, uh, my, my, not my book, uh, my playlist on the secret book of John that really gets into how reality emanated from mind and the material world was created by like this evil being called Yaldabaoth and his archons and all that. Check that out. It's a really important video. But the eons or archons or entities 
all usually represented faculties of mind. So you had, you know, Sophia was wisdom. So Sophia was, Sophia was wisdom. And you had these different beings that represented different faculties of mind. And often you had the, the evil beings that represented what Gnostics would consider evil aspects of, of mind, like desire. Now, I want to be clear, though, that that's another thing that I disagree with Gnosticism is that certain like desire and passion and, and all these things, they're not, they're not, they're not, ne we can have fabulous experiences here in the material realm with passion and desire, and that's fine. We can do that. Um, but you can understand where in their mindset, it's like, oh, well, desire ties us to the material world. And you can see this Buddhist element in here where it's about, oh, it's desire that ties us to the material world. We have to get rid of desire to be able to reach the true reality, the pleroma. And you can see a very, very similar tie to Buddhism, where you one has to get rid of desire to be able to attain nirvana. And so you have very, very uh, strong Buddhist themes going on here as well. And this, the desire is saying, hey, I didn't see you going down. Now you're going up. I didn't see you descending, but I saw you ascending. And remember, descent is just going to lower, lower levels of mind. And ultimately, the lowest is just the material world. That's the lowest level. And desire is going like, hey, I didn't see you descending, but now I see you ascending. Why do you lie since you belong to me? And that's, you know, basically going, hey, you're mine, like desire, you are controlled by desire. And the soul is saying, I served you as a garment and you did not know me. And the idea here is that, uh, you know, you can think of these different things as, as like garments. Um, that one wears, but one does not become controlled. And when the soul said this, the soul, and by the way, this is all the vision that Mary is having. Um, when it said this, the soul went away rejoicing greatly. Again, it came to the third power, which is called ignorance. So you're seeing it's, it's, uh, it's, it's encountering different faculties of mind. And these would be the faculties of mind or, or, or even of the flesh, depending on how one looks at it. it, it it's, it's very semantic, whatever you want to define it as. But there are different um, emotions, powers of mind that the soul is ascending and, and encountering. And it got past desire. Now it's encountering ignorance. It came to the third power, which is called ignorance. The power questions the, questioned the soul, saying, Where are you going? In wickedness are you bound? but you are bound, do not judge. And the soul said, why do you judge me? Although I have not judged, I was bound, though I have not bound. I was not recognized, but I have rec recognized that the all is being dissolved, both the earthly things and the heavenly. And that's so cool as well, because, you know, she's um, battling ignorance here. And ignorance is going, where are you going? I have bound you, essentially. And what what the soul is replying is, I have recognized that the all is being dissolved, both the earthly things and the heavenly, which is basically saying, I'm not ignorant. You don't have any power over me. I understand what existence is. Existence is the all, and all things, earthly things and the heavenly, are just expressions of the all. And these things are being dissolved. And remember, Gnostics viewed the material world as, as being evil, so when one understands what reality is, the more people that understand this, uh, the material world will ultimately crumble. And... So you have this idea of ignorance going, hey, where do you think you're going ascending up into higher levels of mind? I have you bound. And the soul is saying, no, I recognize. I understand. I'm not ignorant. I know what existence is. I see that the all, 
is is one and both earthly things and heavenly that are being dissolved. So when the soul had overcome the third power, it went upwards and saw the fourth power, which took seven forms. The first form is darkness, the second desire, the third ignorance, the fourth is the excitement of death, the fifth is the kingdom of the flesh, and the sixth is the foolish wisdom of flesh, the seventh is the wrathful wisdom, these are the seven powers of wrath. And they asked the soul, Word, whence do you come, slayer of men, or where are you going, conqueror of space? And I love that conqueror of space is so cool because it's the Gnostics were really, really interesting. And they had such a forward way of uh, forward way of thinking and understanding existence. You had these, you know, and it's just so much, it's just so more beautiful rather than, oh, let's all have faith in Jesus Christ because we're sinful to becoming divine conquerors of space. That's just very, very, you know, there's a lot of stuff about Gnosticism that I don't agree with and I, and some stuff I don't like, but there's a lot, a lot of cool stuff, a lot of great stuff to like. And that's one of the things that, that I really like. And, and the metaphor and the symbology is so cool. Having this, you know, fourth power that takes the seven forms of darkness, desire, ignorance. And, you know, again, notice, notice the big parallels uh, to Buddhism overcoming desire uh, and whatnot. But you'll notice one thing that is really, really important that you're going to get uh, time and time and time and time again, according to the Gnostics, is not just overcoming desire of the flesh and all that, but knowledge and understanding. Gnostics means gnosis, it was based on gnosis, which means um, knowing. Gnostics are the ones that know. So you have to understand and know what you are and what existence is. It's not just about desire. But again, I want to emphasize the fact that there's nothing wrong with desire. That was the Gnostics idea. Some Gnostics thought that um, it, a lot of different Gnostics believed different things. The Sethian Gnostics thought, for example, that, uh, you know, they had a problem with sex because they thought that giving birth to children was imprisoning more souls into matter. So the Sethian Gnostics were very uh, ascetic. They tried to give up you know, desires and fleshly things, things like that. But you had other Gnostics like the uh, Cainites who were completely different. And so the Cainites believed that they should indulge in every single kind of sin uh, to be able to transcend the material world. Because first of all, they believed that the creator of the material world was an evil being called Yaldabaoth. So they said, okay, well, whatever Yaldabaoth says God, God says is a sin is probably a good thing to do because he's evil. So they wanted to break all the commandments and sin as much as they can. And their whole idea was that, well, if we experience everything that we can possibly experience, we won't be reincarnated. They believed in reincarnation, by the way. So they believed that, well, Gnostics in general believed in reincarnation because you'd, be, you'd keep being trapped again and again in matter. And they were like, okay, well, if we just experience everything that we can, we won't be pulled back to matter anymore because there won't be any reason to come back because we've experienced everything. So if we experience everything, we'll be able to transcend matter. So you have the Cainites who sinned all that they, you know, sinned, quote unquote, sinned to try and reach transcendence. I have a video of that on that on my channel as well. But then you had the Sethian Gnostics where uh, this, this, this seems to be Sethian. And, and from what I'm gathering from this, it seems very Sethian to have this, uh, condemnation of desire, uh, et cetera. I mean, it could be Valentinian. Um, I, I don't know. It could be Valentinian or Sethian. But in any case, there's this negative connotation about um, desire. Uh, I just want to make it clear that there's nothing wrong with desire. You can, you don't have to be an ascetic. You don't have to give up things. Uh, that's totally fine to enjoy life. It's, it's okay. Because remember, the Gnostics' whole idea was, oh, we are here. We're trapped here. Our goal is to escape. That's not what's actually happening. We are here to learn, grow, and understand. It only seems like a hell because the world is run by people who only care about themselves and they have no knowledge of existence. And so with the, the terrible society we have today, it's a product of terrible people in control. But we can create a beautiful world here. We can do that. We can create a wonderful world. It doesn't have to be terrible. The Gnostics looked around and went, oh man, the world's so shitty, it must be a prison. But we are at the point where we understand, oh, well, the world's shitty because it's run by shitty people. It doesn't have to be shitty. So 
it's not like, oh, well, we have to give up things of the flesh and desire to be able to ascend. No, there's nothing wrong with experiencing and enjoying life. That's a big part of why we're here. We're here to learn, grow, understand, and experience, have meaningful experiences, and have enjoyment as well. All these things are great and what we should be doing. You don't have to try and give up all that stuff and just, you know, med meditate for eight hours a day and, and give up all your favorite things. You, you don't have to do that. It's perfectly fine. Half the reason why we're here is to have a, have a fantastic experience. But we have to build a better world in order to do that. So, but anyway, this is really cool. And whence do you, you know, where do you come from? Where are you going, conqueror of space? They're asking. And the soul answered and said, what binds me has been slain and what turns me about has been overcome and my desire has been ended and ignorance has died. In an eon, I was released from a world and in a type from a type and from the fetter of oblivion, which is transient. From this time on, I will attain to the rest of the time of the season of the eon in silence. You know, they, they had a very poetic and beautiful way of writing. Transient oblivion. I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. From the fetter of oblivion, which is transient. So that is the end of chapter eight. And then in chapter nine, we get to the point where luckily, luckily we have the conclusion. So Mary has been telling all this to the disciples. Cause remember Jesus left, Mary took the role of leader uh, of the leader and the disciples don't know what to do. And she's saying, Hey, don't worry. It's all going to be okay. And they're like, Hey, what's going on? Can you, can you teach us? And she's like, sure, I will teach you about the hidden things. And she begins to tell them about the different levels of reality beyond matter and how to overcome it, how to overcome ignorance, how to overcome the, the wrathful wisdom, the fear of death, the kingdom of the flesh, etc. And she's telling, teaching all this to the, to the disciples. Now, when Mary had said this, she fell silent since it was to this point that the Savior had spoken with her. But Andrew answered and said to the brethren, Say what you wish to say about what she has said. I at least do not believe that the Savior said this, for certainly these teachings are strange ideas. So one of the disciples, Andrew, doesn't believe her. It's like this, he's, he's, he's going, this shit is crazy. I ain't buying it. So Andrew's saying, this is all very strange. I don't believe that the Savior said this. These are very strange ideas. Now, remember, uh, I believe that this is a criticism of orthodoxy. And so these disciples criticizing Mary would represent orthodoxy criticizing Gnosticism. Because remember, Gnosticism is the, uh, all this stuff are the, are the truths and secrets of Gnosticism, that reality is, a, is, a, is an illusion, that the true world is a domain of mind, and that one can overcome it. And Mary, as Gnosticism, is teaching this and the other versions of Christianity are saying, I, you know, in saying, I don't believe that the savior taught, said these things. I, this is, these are strange ideas. These are like the other versions of Christianity going, I don't think that this is actually, um, what, what Christianity is. I think these are crazy ideas. And that's exactly what happened with the Gnostics. The Gnostics were, they had these ideas, were very feminine inclusive, and then the, the 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 church, what would become the church, what would become the church was like these are crazy ideas. And Peter answered and spoke concerning the same thing. So Peter agrees, another disciple agrees with Andrew. He questioned them about the Savior. Did he really speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and listen and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? So now you have this idea of they're not believing because she's a woman and he's, and they're, they're being very sexist. They're going, well, do, would, would, would Christ really tell this to a woman and not us? And there is this, again, this connotation that we see in Christian orthodoxy wanting a patriarchy and diminishing the feminine aspect and the role of the feminine. So you can see that role being taken 
by Peter and Andrew, and Peter specifically in this point, by going, these are crazy ideas. You really think Christ is going to tell this to a woman and and you and 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 prefer them to us and and so basically this is going you know those who who looked at gnosticism and went not these gnostic ideas are crazy first of all they're weird and look at how look at all the you know powerful feminine characters in it don't you think god would would want powerful male figures you know you see what i'm saying it's it's this criticism coming from other versions that would be criticizing gnosticism and we see that played out with peter criticizing Peter and Andrew criticizing Mary. Then Mary wept and said to Peter, my brother Peter, what did you think? And this is important because the, the, the disciples really went out and established the, the various churches. And so um, it's this seeing this as this criticism is important where basically the Gnostics as Mary are, are crying and 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 being like they're just trying to teach that's what the gnostics would do by the way they would go to you know other christian services or whatnot or or, or meetings and and they could go hey you know people who they 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 would look for people who because i remember i told you that there's the exoteric version the version where people believe the story just for the surface level, the story is what it is, and they don't see the deeper meaning. And then there are people who see the deeper meaning. And so the Gnostics, when they would see Christians who were seeing, had the eyes to see, had the mind to understand, were seeing that there was more to than what it seems, they'd go, hey, let's. we want to tell you these secrets. We want to tell you these teachings. We want to tell you the truth about what's going on. And so this whole idea here is about the Gnostics trying to impart this knowledge, but it being rejected by the Christians of the time and them condemning, calling them a liar and having these condemnations against the Gnostics. And this is, we see this with Mary weeping and saying to brother Peter, my brother, Peter, what do you think? Do you think that I have thought this up myself in my heart or that I'm lying about the savior? Levi answered and said to Peter, Peter, you have always been hot tempered. Now I see you contending against the women like the adversaries. So now you have another disciple pointing out that Peter is being sexist and making women into adversaries, which is, which is very, very sad and, and terrible. But what we saw in what happened with Christian orthodoxy, in Christian orthodoxy, uh, women aren't necessarily adversaries, but the Gnostics were adversaries and the Gnostics supported the feminine uh, empowerment and inclusiveness of that. Um, and I always want to remind you all, Gnosticism wasn't perfect. There were sexist elements in Gnosticism, but compared to orthodoxy, and you can see just by reading stories like this, clearly there were some very, very powerful and important uh, feminine aspects that, that are really great. And so you have the Christians of the time looking at Gnosticism and going, all right, well, there's all these feminine. And, and you even had uh, later on, it was the, Val I believe, the Valentinian Gnostics who actually started to, so, so, the, so Scythian Gnosticism has tons of powerful female characters and heroes. And it declares the God of the Old Testament as being evil. And you can imagine that there were a lot of Christians who didn't like this. They didn't like the, the powerful feminine figures, and they didn't like calling God of the Bible an evil being, Yaldabaoth, the blind God, Samael. And so then you had a different version of Gnosticism come around, Valentinian Gnosticism. And what they did, and this, is, this sucks, but what they did was they said, hey, let's try and make this more palatable to people. And, and so what they did was it was still Gnosticism, but instead of God being evil, they made God, uh, not evil, but just a lesser God, not the true God. The God of the Bible wasn't the true God, but he wasn't necessarily evil. And they also started really to downplay, uh, the feminine roles. And it's unfortunate, but the Gnostics were trying to get this information across and the Valentinian Gnostics were like, well, hey, no one's listening to us because we're saying God is evil and we have all these powerful feminine figures. So let's 
try and change that. So that's really unfortunate. Um, but you can see that they were trying their best to get this information across to a very <laughs> uh, critical audience who eventually killed them, you know, and, and burned their books. So you, you can see this here. And in orthodoxy, women weren't necessarily adversaries, but they were lesser than men. In the New Testament, it says women must be quiet. Uh, they're not allowed to teach that they are lesser than men, that they must submit to their husbands and everything. They're blamed for the original sin because they were deceived by the serpent and not Adam, that Eve was, but that they can uh, save themselves by giving birth to children. So really a uh, very, very, very poor view of women the Christian orthodoxy has in the New Testament. Um, so Levi is saying, Peter, you've always been hot-tempered, and now I see you fighting against the women like the adversaries. But if the Savior made her worthy, why are you indeed to reject her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. That is why he loved her more than us. Rather, let us be ashamed and put on the perfect man and separate as he commanded us and preach the gospel, not laying down any other rule or other law beyond what the Savior said. And when they heard this, they began to go forth to proclaim and to preach. And thus ends the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And like I said, we only have a couple chapters of this when a, whole, a lot of it was lost, unfortunately. But you can see the, the parts that we do have are extremely important. And it's just a really uh, beautiful story of, you know, Mary being the one who understood the truth of Jesus and being that successor to Jesus. And, and the metaphor of Mary being the successor of Jesus is the metaphor of Gnosticism should have been the true version of Christianity to lead, not orthodoxy, not what would become orthodoxy, not these other versions. But of course, that didn't happen. Uh, Gnostics were destroyed. Um, so uh, this, this is, despite not having a lot of this, what we do have is excellent. And I highly recommend, if you enjoy these, uh, check out my other videos, especially on uh, the Apocalypse of Adam, uh, which talks about the story of the Garden of Eve from the perspective of Adam and Eve, and Garden of Eden from Adam and Eve, and talks about how Adam and Eve were originally one being that the evil God split into two. So you have a nice equality of, of male and female there as well. And um, Eve is a hero. Her daughter Norea actually defeats God. Highly recommend that one. Uh, it's an excellent one if you enjoyed this. Again, it's called The Apocalypse of Adam. Check it out. It is excellent. Now, thank you so much for joining me. And if you ever feel like you've learned something or gotten something from my videos, consider supporting on Patreon. It helps out a lot. You'll get access to our weekly secret live streams, our hidden Discord server, The Citadel. I want to give a shout out to everyone who does support, um, especially Zach, Renaissance Fairy, Cassidy, Michael, Angela, Maria, Top of the World, Ethan, DB, Joel, and everyone else. The link will pop up right over here. Thank you very much.